So what is space advantage? And why it's important? You know, when I'm teaching my students, very often I like to compare with some other sports. And most often I compare chess with football. And why with football? Okay, maybe some other team sports could work just fine as well. Because the one who controls the middle of the football field, like the center, he is not only a step closer to uh, start a strong attack or try to score a goal, uh, but he's also making his opponent's advances against his goal post much less likely to happen. So essentially that's why this, this fight for the center is so important. It is important in football, so there's this even measurement, the ball possession, uh, who controls the middle of the uh, middle of the field, and something like this is also um, working like that in chess. I'm gonna start with um, uh, dividing what we're gonna talk about today. So first, we're gonna talk about the very first beginning is that which openings feature space advantage. I'm gonna introduce you to them. The second part will be um, why the space advantage is essentially a catalyst for an attack. Because it's like in football, you're controlling the center of the field. You're obviously much closer to score a goal and in chess it's going to be quite similar. Uh, then we are gonna talk about uh, some of the most important rules. There's actually not so many of them, basically two rules. But sometimes people forget thinking about them when they have the space advantage. And uh, finally, the fourth part of this bootcamp will be the uh, latest developments of side pawn pushes in order to claim some space advantage, which is done thanks to the development of modern chess engines mainly. And we are going to try to understand why, why this is important. Sometimes the topic is going to overlap with some other topics, like the pawn play, the book, essentially, which I'm about to write, or maybe how to properly attack, but still the core will be the space advantage. All right. All right, let's uh, start with the first one. So the most famous, the most famous uh, opening, which features the space advantage. is the King's Indian defense, uh, which has been championed throughout the many years by some of the best players in the world. From the Blacks perspective, Gary Kasparov, Robbie James Fisher, the world champions today, actually not really recently, but until not long time ago, it was Hikaru Nakamura, also right now Timur Rajabov. So Black allows White to take space, take the center, and his idea is that he is going to demolish it in one way or another. Right? So right now the reputation of the King's Indian defense is that it's not really that popular at the highest level, but still at the club level, it is incredibly popular. For the main reason is that the system, knight f6, g6, bishop g7, short castle, can be played against everything except e4. And that's what makes it a very appealing continuation because you don't essentially have to know a lot. The main drawback is that you simply, from the black perspective, give white a lot of space. So white immediately already controls what is happening here in his calf of the board and has something to say what's happening on the fifth rank. So this means that white automatically secures himself some advantages. So this will be opening number one, one of the most popular ones. Uh, also, since I'm writing the Dutch Leningrad, Dutch Leningrad features also very often space advantage from the white perspective. For example, let me just input some couple of moves. G3, G6, one of the most popular continuations. And often, instead of just humbly develop, developing the pieces like knight C3, B3, bishop B2, there is 
a very popular approach of B4. B4, bishop B2, knight C3, and white tries to aggressively expand on the queen side. And of course, this is also included in my upcoming chessable course, how black should treat this. But if black is not aggressive, for example, if he plays something like, I'm not really sure, something like queen E8, and let's say he plays something like knight C7, the odds are that white opens up the queen side a bit faster and because he has better developed pieces compared to black white almost always is better that's the idea so dan is asking is the downside of space advantage a weaker back rank um you mean the one who controls the space advantage well maybe I guess if you are not having enough pieces, maybe you might have some weaker back ranks, but I'm not entirely sure. I understood the question correctly. So meaning that if you are controlling space advantage, is your back rank not weakened? I, I guess it depends how many pieces you have on the board. Are we going to talk about some of the rules which apply when do you have space advantage or, or space advantage or not? So this will be like a second opening. Also, very popular openings are like Pierce Offensive and the Tiger after e4. Also, not very popular, mainly because of either f4, knight f3, or knight f3, let's say something like bishop c4 and queen e2. Again, white controls the center. So it's not really a great idea to give up the center and Pierce defense or Pierce Offensive is um yeah not not a very popular weapon the same applies also for the tiger uh here after e4 g6 it has some decent popularity i mean black can completely ignores the center for example knight c3 d6 white normally plays a four tries to gain space black plays a6 black plays b5 and tries to undermine white center with some timely executed c5 its reputation it's dangerous once again because the one who controls the center most of the time calls all the shots uh, i don't think it works like in football if you play on your opponent's half you weaken your defense those examples will be quite rare because you still need to crash through the middle field it's quite rare i would say it is possible that your back rank becomes weaker like you're missing uh, some attack from the side and somehow your opponent penetrates you uh your back rank but in chess it's I, I don't think it's very often to be honest at least from my examples i'm about to show you i i don't recall it and of course there's many other openings for example Openings like leg high defense, knight f6. Again, there's a very good reason why it's not very popular. Because white very quickly gains space, plays c4, and there's there's f4, there's knight f3, there's even e takes on d6, so white controls the center. The knight is moving already for several times, so it means that white already secures himself some better prospects in the opening. All right, so those are the openings. But let's start with the first serious part, which is um, that essentially the one who controls space um, can use this position as a catalyst for an attack. So let me show you the very first example. Um, just a second. <clears throat> okay, for example, this game. Um, this is a game between uh, former world champion Tigran Petrosian playing against Unto Venalainen, presumably a Finnish player. This was a Marozzi bind, and um, White seemingly enjoys an opening success. Why is this? Because, at least visually, we can see that White controls more space. 
So we have a queen on d4, black has no pieces on the fifth rank. We have the knight on d5, a black has even no pieces. Uh, yeah, basically the same, black has no pieces uh, to challenge it. So no pieces here, we have uh, uh, pieces on the uh, fourth and fifth rank and blacks, all of the army is positioned in the final three ranks. So why? Having a space advantage is a catalyst for attack very often because again we are like a step closer to start a king's attack and as you can see in this position uh, black is seemingly very solid but his king is feeling a bit unsecure. So not only Petrosian continues to play for uh, space advantage but he starts to think about a potential king's attack. So what he does, what he did, he played rook c3, which is a really smart move because it doesn't reveal anything. Let's say if black would take on d5, I would take with a pawn, open up the c file, hit the pawn on a6. And if black plays b5, white reserves the opportunity to play rook c1 and completely take over the c file. So we could try to limit black's pieces something like b4, I don't know, make a window for the king somewhere, Play rook c7, queen c7, penetrate black's defenses and be annoying. So that's why this rook c3 is a multi-purpose move. Here uh, when the lion played queen c8, offering a queen trade. Petrosian played a 4 because now the idea is also revealed that the rook is very active on the third rank. Not only white is anticipating bishop d5, cdx on d5, the queen will be under attack. But what is also thinking about rook g3 or even ideas like a5, rook h3 and start to march at the king side. Exactly, because of your uh, advances, you have a lot of room to move your own pieces. Black doesn't have it. So the game progressed with queen c5. And uh, obviously, one of the most important pieces to conduct a successful attack he is the queen. So Petrosian, of course, said no to the queen trade. Now you see already he's thinking about rook g3, a5, queen h6 ideas. So black played here, rook c1, still anticipating bishop d5, cdx on d5, queen f2. Now Petrosian changed his mind. He saw a way to win a tempi, rook f1, played an, a f5 idea, and after bishop takes on d5, he changed his mind. He did not play cdx on d5. Why? Because the c-file no longer matters. He played edx on d5 and there's no more moves, but suddenly white's attack is incredibly strong. There's rook h3, a queen h6 threatening, and it's not really clear how black is planning to defend the h7 pawn. So for example, he will play something like knight of eight. We could play rook h3, queen e4, and just try to open up the position like take it, not really sure, um, maybe h takes, queen h6, queen e5, and we're looking for some sort of a killing blow. I really can definitely sense there could be some tactical ideas like bishop g4, take it, and bishop e6. And you see the point is f takes on e6, you take on f8, rook f8, and deliver a checkmate on h7. So this idea to exploit h file could be there, and yeah, I don't know what can even black do here. Yeah, probably nothing, because bishop f7 also is a killing threat. So it's just an idea. But again, I, I hope you see the pattern that Petrosian sensed that white can start a king's attack and he uses the center, he uses the space advantage to facilitate a direct attack. Let me show you more. And uh, during my, uh, when I was compiling the examples, I obviously found a lot of my own games. <clears throat> this is one of my Blitz games, which I played against one of our youngsters uh, here in Latvia. It uh, started to be, um, it, it, it was in the beginning a Dutch defense, Dutch Leningrad. I managed to play e5. My opponent did not react appropriately and 
I was able to play e4, b5 and secure myself pretty solid space advantage. So once again, look at this. So we have the pawn, which is across the middle of the board. So this is the middle. The pawn is on e4, the pawn is on d5. So it means we already have some space advantage. White's knights, they're not doing anything. They're a bit cramped. And the bishop on g2 is staring at the pawn on e4 and also the bishop on c1 is not doing a lot. So visually you're looking at this position and you think, what is doing okay? Right? I mean, I have Fianchetto on my bishop here. I'm about to Fianchetto on my bishop here. I have some more or less all right placement for my knights. But actually this position is incredibly dangerous from a strategical point of view. And the point is why I said that space advantage can be used as a catalyst to uh, start a direct assault, it also applies here. Because, I mean, you remember one of the main reasons why are we even supposed to cast a short? By the way, a lot of people do it automatically, they cast a short without asking any questions. But remember the two principles, why are you castling at all? Which is, you bring the king to the safety and you connect the rooks. That's it. There is no other reason. I mean, there is no rule which says you have to cast lot at all costs. So here the king on the eight, because you control space advantage, you see, I mean, all of these pawns, all of these pieces in front of the king, they protect the king. This means the king's safety is no longer a factor. We could connect the rooks, but we could already think about could we give this rook and h8 already an open file? And too many players are accustomed that first they cast a short automatically and then they try to open up this f file, something like rook, a short castle g5, f4, and try to open up this f file because we kept the pawn on f5. But listen, we can already do it right now. We can play h5 immediately. And one of the rules of starting a successful king set attack is you make sure that your opponent cannot counter strike in the center. I mean, look at the position, center is closed. It means your opponent will be unable to counter strike in the center to meet your flank attack. If we to play h4, try to stop it, we can be very aggressive. Just an idea, again, I'm not entirely sure about the move order. Play g5, play knight g4, followed by queen g5, h4, and start an attack. You might be concerned about the king's safety on e8, but again, ask yourself, who is bothering it? Nobody. So this is the reason why why did not play uh, h4, but if white doesn't do that, black wants to play h4, how about king f7, queen g8, queen h7? Or, or king f7, or maybe find a different way, king f8, h4, queen e8, queen h5, which, assuming, avoids the queen trade. It looks incredibly unpleasant. So why try to organize this counter strike in the center? It just weakened the king. h4, why try to open it up? Open, you see there's no kinds of sacrifices on center. Everything is locked, c takes, c takes. So he tried to organize something, 9b5 and his position just collapsed very quickly and black was able to start the killing attack and that's it just like that after the opening black was immediately victorious so once again please understand the main factor for starting a successful king set attack a direct assault was coming straight out of having a significant space advantage all right, let me show more. <clears throat> Another example. There's going to be a lot of examples. So in case you feel like I want to, I should walk through them slower, I can do that. Uh, this is one of my nicest games I played a couple of years ago in French Team Chess Championship. I believe it was in Shutter. And uh, black just played 95. Now this is going to be one of the rules we are going to talk about a bit later, but 
Okay, fine. I think I already can mention it that one of the rules when you are having the space advantage is you won't avoid peace trades. And why this is important? Because again, we have the space, right? We have the pawn on the fifth rank. So we have pawn on fourth rank, on the fifth rank. He has the pawn on fifth rank, the sixth rank. So we are far more advanced. We are about to even play a four, maybe e5, or maybe f4, f5. So no matter how you look, White has secured himself more space using his pawns. So the rule is that when you are controlling the space, you don't want to trade pieces. And why? Because when you don't have a lot of space for your pieces and they start to gather there, if there are too many of them, it means your opponent will be feeling essentially claustrophobic. So he needs space for his pieces. I mean, imagine yourself, you are, I don't know, locked in a, in a, I don't know, in a basement and you get even uh, 10 people to join you. I don't think it's going to be very comfortable for you, right? There's too many people. So naturally you want to kick somebody out to have more space so that you can freely move. Otherwise you get really claustrophobic and you, you, have, no, you have no room. And the same applies also in chess. If you don't have enough space for your pieces, they obviously do not operate at their strength, at their actual strength. And that's why here the knight on e5, look at it, this is going to be really important. The knight on e5 is, uh, <laughs> the knight on e5 is really nice piece. Yeah, it feels like such a nice knight, it controls the center. But if black is able to take on c4, Black is able to put the knight on d7, for example, let's put it like this. The space advantage no longer even feels, because now black has successfully removed one piece of the board. The bishop is active, the knight is active, the rook is active. Okay, maybe trade a couple of more pieces and, you know, actually black can easily take over the game. Because of ideas like knight e5 or, or knight b6, get to the pawn on b4. So it's in white's best interest keep the bishop alive so that this knight on e5 as great as it is it's not doing anything so why this is going to be a catalyst to start a potential king's attack look at this how the game progresses 98 so black is seeking to play knight c7 knight b5 otherwise how else does he activate his pieces i mean i'm about to play a four at some point anyway so black plays 98, king h1, preparation for f4, making sure there is no c4 discovered check and black activates the queen, knight c7. And now one of the rules we already know that when you are having this space advantage, you don't want to trade pieces. So what do you do? Look at this knight on c7, it's not doing anything. So what do you do? You play f4, you don't allow it to be traded. The main concern perhaps is, wait, but are we not weakening the pawn on b3? We are. But the question is, can your opponent exploit it? And exploit, he did try. He played rook b7. We push away this piece. Knight e7. Now, do you see what I'm seeing here? He has a lot of pieces on the 7th rank. I mean, these are not great pieces. The knight on c7 not doing much the knight on d7 it goes to b6 and then what the rook on b7 doesn't have a lot of squares the queen on a7 doesn't have a lot of squares so this means that black would love to trade off some pieces to get a freer game now we can do is improve the knight on c3 which is not doing much here you see it has no future so we improve it Put it on e3 so that it could, potentially it could jump to c4, a5, and maybe even c6. Black plays knight b6. And now I'm going to have a question to you. Do you play knight c4 with the idea to play knight a5, knight c6, and allow the knight trade? How much do you understand from what I was saying with the introduction? I guess not. 
But you know, very often the the response is, but they're the they're the same amount, right? I mean, the night is three, and the night is three, so it seems to be equal. Well, no, no, it's not equal, because in order to determine which is a better piece, so a night can be better than the other night, you simply count the number of physical moves it can make. So the knight on b6 can make physically only two moves. I can make, which, which makes sense, one, two, three. Okay, technically even four, but I mean, technically he could also play knight e5 or knight f4. So I have more sensible moves. And also look at this, he has amassed a lot of pieces at the queen side. And by having established a solid space advantage, this is a clear indication that you might have a great moment to start a king's attack. Because look at this, this bishop is the only defender of the black king. So whatever you do, basically either you play a five, a five, nine g4, and start a direct assault at the king side, these pieces are completely disconnected. The pawn on b3 doesn't matter at all. Or like I played in this game, play h4, try to provoke some targets, works nicely. So Black, of course, felt that things are heating up incredibly quickly. He tried to follow the rule, meaning my opponent starts a flank attack, what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to do a counter strike in the center. It's pretty logical. The center is not locked. So he played a sixth. The only problem is this is what I wanted. I wanted him to play e6 because now the point is after a5, I push away the knight, I take on e6, f takes on e6 is out of the question, his king is getting incredibly weak. And even if he does get access to the d4 square for the knight, suddenly I have a monster bishop on c4 with knight g4, f5, h5, threat still to follow. I was able to win a very, very nice game. So again, you still see black is having most of his important pieces tucked away at the queen side. He tried to organize something here of the king side, 9g4, more pieces joined here, the bishop at f7, the rook on f1, they're starting to become really dangerous force, and the black was just unable to hold this together. I mean, he did try, he did try everything he could. Now you see the bishop, the two rooks, the queen, and the game finished with a pretty easy exchange sacrifice, bishop e6, Rook g6 and mate on the board, meaning king f8 followed by rook g8 or rook h6. No matter where the king goes, we are winning. Now you see, actually, this bishop on c4, the last square bishop became a monster. So do you remember? Do you remember our choice? What we did right now? So we're strictly following the space advantage rule, meaning it seems like it's an equal trade. Somebody is going to even say that the knight on e5 is a better piece. But it's not. In the long run, we did not trade it because we felt that f4 is about to follow. The bishop on e2 is a really monster. And then by successfully starting a king set attack with h4, we anticipate that black is going to play e6, which he has to do it. I mean, otherwise, h5 followed by f5 and knight g4 things start to look really dangerous now this bishop becomes a monster although he has of course this beautiful knight on d4 all right um let me show you more uh this game i was on the receiving side i was playing against Bartomalej Heberla, a Polish grandmaster, a chess coach from Poland. Uh, we played a Ra Lopez game, or maybe it was Italian game, I don't remember, several years ago. And quite typical to the Ra Lopez, White enjoys a nice space advantage. Again, how do we determine this? Look at this. The pawn is on d5 together with the pawn on e4, it means that white simply controls more space. The bishop in f8 is pretty terrible. I mean, it's staring at the pawn, although it's protecting the king. 
And also the main problem child is the knight on a6, which doesn't do much. So, I mean, black is dreaming, of course, about the idea uh, to play something like b4, knight c5, bishop b5, or maybe in some dream scenario, if white allows it, bishop b7, bishop d8, and bishop b6. Trade the ducks with bishops, then put the knight on c5, play b4, and then try to get to this pawn on b3. But probably all of you, you already counted how many moves did it take. Way too much. So white controls space advantage, and we already know that controlling space advantage could be the catalyst to start a king's attack, or wherever the opponent's king is. So we can do the same here. So what White did? He played knight h4. Knight h4 idea is really nice. He wants to put the knight on f5, get closer to these pawns, but most importantly, initiate the so-called pawn play. Meaning, I very often talk with this about my with my students that if you don't use your pawns properly, then sometimes it's very difficult to achieve any serious progress. So white needs this f pawn. Why? Because it allows white also to use the f file and the rook on e1 to join the game. So. I play g6 from the black's perspective, you know, trying to take away the f5 square for the knight, maybe put the bishop on g7, a 4. Uh, g5 uh, tactically doesn't work. This would be a disaster because of bishop d2. And bishop e3, and the knight gets to a 5. We can't allow this. So it tactically simply fails. So there's no fork. So queen b4 was played. Bishop d2, and now white, together uh, with his king's side ambition, is trying to lock away the knight on a6 from the game. So in case you're wondering why white is not trading the queens, the automatic bishop e3, because white just played f4 and knight, played knight h4 and f4 in order to start a king's side attack. So we need a queen for this. So I played with black rook c8, try to activate the pieces. Now the knight has done its job, it's time to go back. Queen b2, so black is seemingly very aggressive, very active. The c file doesn't matter. Bishop e3, white is threatening with bishop d4. Bishop g7. Rook e2, again, no points of penetration, everything is well protected. Bishop d2, and now the key idea, queen e1. Incredibly strong move. So white is threatening to completely shut off the knight on a6 from the game. If he gets to play b4, followed by something like bishop d3, white has a wonderful peace harmony, and the knight on a6, well, it's something we would love to trade. So again, picture this from the black's perspective. We are feeling claustrophobic. We want to trade pieces. And if I was able to trade one piece, from Black's perspective, which would it be? Totally the knight on a6 for the knight on f3. But I can't do it. I physically can't do it. So that's why I play with Black b4, so that White is unable to play b4 himself. I also open up the b5 square for the bishop, open up the d7 square for the knight. I mean, so far it makes perfect sense. So White play bishop d3, attacking the knight. Uh, there were some issues with bishop b5, which still probably should have been played. And bishop e3, bishop d4, and finally we get to the critical moment. White uses the space advantage to hit the knight on f6. And suddenly switch to a king's set attack. And again, the space advantage, it facilitated this direct attack at the king's side. So again, it feels that black is almost all right. The knight on c6 finally joins the game. But the problem is white is very fast with the attack and I can't defend the pawn on h6 properly. How do I defend that? g5, queen f6, king h7, just take on f7. Yeah, hello, dear all the newcomers. So I try to complicate the game. Queen h6, rook f2, Rook a2, so white is attacking from all sides. 
9g5 there's nothing to be done and mate on the board yeah, so it was really powerful really powerful game from heberla again rook c8 queen h8 queen h7 queen h8 collect the rook somewhere there's a mate and uh yeah i i think i could have started i could have started of course this position with this but i felt i felt that you have to understand this moment because white has secured himself space advantage uh and needs to decide which direction to take the game so if we allow black to trade the knight or we allow to black for example play bishop e7 bishop d8 bishop b6 we play something slower we allow black to activate his pieces and i think he's actually doing great so that's why when you have the space and we when you're getting closer to the opponent's king consider starting a direct assault so my opponent he played textbook game um why not play h5 i think we have to go here here right h5 is queen h6 it doesn't stop 9g5 threat that's the problem i i can't defend right there's there's nothing to be done f6 drops the pawn on g6 i have pieces here the queen side but again you you gotta see the pattern black doesn't have enough defenders and that's why it's such a great idea that whenever you're controlling the space advantage you're thinking about to use it as a catalyst to start the direct attack let me show you more all right this is actually one of my uh, favorite examples because it was pretty advanced <clears throat> why the leka in defense is a bad idea and i absolutely enjoy playing against the leka in defense every single time my opponent hands me on the platter the center allows me to bring out the pieces have a nice harmony um i just want to stand up and say thank you so this game i played um wow five years ago already unbelievable yeah five years ago i was doing a chess tour in the united states so first i played in las vegas i believe this was the uh, national open against uh dennis boros uh, he's originally from hungary but i think he was either working or studying in the united states i'm not entirely sure another fellow grandmaster how do you combat space advancement well try not to allow it i mean play openings in general which don't allow your opponent to grab space yes i know dennis he's streaming as well yes i know chess weaves right if i remember correctly right so uh white uh, black wants to play bishop g6 black wants to play bishop g6 and trade a couple of pieces so we already know what he wants we know the rules we know that since black is feeling a bit claustrophobic with his pieces he would love to get rid of some of the pieces for example get off the get off the bishops get off let's say pair of knights and then he's doing okay so we are not gonna allow him to do that we play knight f4 hit the bishop bishop here we trade with the knight and now pretty important my recommendation is sometimes when you're not entirely sure how to continue i love to think backwards it's like when i'm looking at this position what's the first move which is jumping to your attention you're like oh it's rookie one right i mean i have an open file i should play rookie one i should try to fight for this open file maybe somebody's gonna say no no d5 is the way to go because i'm attacking the knight then maybe retreat with the bishop which is probably still also fine and maybe then play something like a four to completely squeeze the opponent right but my suggestion is ask yourself what does the opponent want and uh, since you have the space advantage 
it's safe to assume that your opponent wants to trade off some pieces and one of the most important maneuvers in this position is either knight f5 attacking the bishop on e3 and the pawn on d4 or d5 by the way d5 is a very crucial idea because he wants to combat my center so let's say yeah by the way the pawn is under attack on d4 so i shouldn't miss that so let's say i play let's say i play something like bishop c2 black could play d5 he could play knight c8 a very common idea in uh, in the alekine and uh, put the knight on the five yeah let's say if i'm not really accurate knight e7 i play whatever a3 knight f5 takes takes and black is doing great how come right black is doing great he has a nice knight he has a nice bishop plays g6 i don't know put the queen knight c8 knight e6 he's doing great well clearly you didn't do something right so we are going to think backwards since my opponent wants to play d5 or 97 knight f5 what we can do we can deal with these two things simultaneously can you come up with the idea which deals with the move d5 i think it's going to be pretty easy uh, d5 ourselves it could be an idea but I, what i don't like it opens up the bishop bishop e4 looks suspicious why i think it looks just nice we protect the pawn and we make sure that d5 is not happening it's actually a pretty logical move a4 a4 a5 i'm not sure what changes actually i think we handed the b4 square on the platter so no more d5 definitely this knight is going to b4 nice outpost this knight already could go to c5 the bishop on d3 has seen better days so i'm afraid not a4 but bishop e4 i really love so black cannot play knight e7 why we grab the pawn just like that we take the pawn so he can't play knight e7 he can't play d5 so what do you think he's gonna do rook b8 have i written any books i have written four chessable courses you can check them out and uh as i already mentioned in the very beginning during these days i have reached a formal agreement with quality chess so i will write my very first book more details will come later so black played rook b8 and his idea is to play knight e7 and either d5 or knight f5 now who wants to be bold and who wants to show the understanding of the space advantage so we know what black wants we are thinking backwards we're thinking black wants to play 97 d5 and 95 what are you going to do about it and that's why we have no time for the next move like rook e1 like rook d1 like h3 wow that was actually pretty quick yeah but do you understand why g4 what's so special about the move g4 i mean why not i mean we are weakening the king right but the question is who is gonna exploit this i mean how you are getting punished for weakening the king there's no peace even in the close vicinity for the king right so also 97 not only he can't play 95 we have g5 we're actually winning the bishop on the spot so g4 accomplishes two things at the same time so we are taking away that five square we are not allowing him to play 97 he can't play d5 he can't play 97 so what can he do he played g5 himself which was pretty smart right i mean he is uh stopping our advancement of g5 he wants to play knight e7 he wants to play d5 and now remember what i told you having space advantage very often is the catalyst for a direct attack so your opponent just played g5 and he is weakening 
his own king. Now, what do you think we could do? H4 is tempting. Yeah, I mean, this is actually incredibly tempting. Like H4 takes it, uh, G5. Look at his position. I mean, he's pretty cramped, is he not? You know, actually, I look at this and it, it makes perfect sense. Something like, think about, think about something like maybe either G6, continue the attack, King G2, Rook H1. But at the same time, we don't want to rush, right? So when you are trying to start this direct assault, remember how Petrosian played. So he is, an, he, he is getting ready for this direct attack, but at the same time, he's not burning all the bridges. King G2, Knight E2, Knight E2 drops the bishop on E4. King G2, I like it. It's a nice move. But then again, you have to anticipate what you're going to do. What you're going to do against ninety seven and d five? Your opponent wants to do this. D five drops a piece. I'm afraid on e four. You can't do this. And we continue to use the g four pawn as a positional move. So actually, g four is a really, really odd fianchetta of the bishop. Remember bishop e4? We played it really weird, but now it positioned the bishop on g2. We protect the king, but most importantly, we are preparing to play knight e4 and hit the pawn on g5. How about this? So black defended with g5 against our pawn march, but now knight e4 is on the table. It's pretty obvious, right? I mean, we protect the king, Knight e4 looks very dangerous, so he played knight e7. Again, it's very difficult to criticize black, like knight e7, now I just take the pawn on g5, so what does he do? So he played knight d7, trying to play knight f8, knight g6, knight h4, knight f4, whatever. So we play knight e4, hit the pawn on g5, he plays knight f8. And he is saying, okay, you can have the pawn on g5. But I'm going to have the pawn on d4, which, by the way, I think it's still okay. For example, you play bishop g5, bishop g5, knight g5, a knight e4, and I don't know, think about maybe thinking, taking here. Sometimes the pawn on a7 is under attack, or keep the knight on g5 with some f4 ideas, etc. The king is pretty weak. But there's more. This could be pretty difficult for you. But... I hope you'll, you're going to pick up the concept. When we have space advantage, we're thinking about starting a direct assault. I said it's bad to trade when space advantage. Um, probably it's a good idea to clarify. You can step away from the rule if you see some positive changes in your position. So it's like... It's like, let's say, when you have two bishop advantage, it's not a good idea to trade one of the bishops unless you get something. So transitioning the advantage from one form to another is very important. F4, precisely. F4, we start the direct attack. Perfect moment, perfect timing. So we have beautiful pieces here. We're hitting the pawn on g5. So what does he do? I mean, he takes it. Rook f4, bishop g5. Uh, what do you mean, global rule? Now the big question, how to uh, start a direct assault. This is probably going to be one of the most difficult moves of today's boot camp. But naturally, we're thinking about how to expose the king. Knight g5 looks good. But, you know, when I saw the following move, I just couldn't resist. Rook f7. So what happens now? A beautiful killer move. Now the point is, if he takes an f7, knight g5, bishop d5, I mean, you gotta sense this is a mate, right? Totally a mate. I mean, king h8, queen g2, queen h3 looks so bad. So he can't do it. Um, if he plays rook e4, there is um, 
I think bishop g5, intermezzo. Again, pretty easy to call it. Rook is under attack, the queen is under attack, all kinds of intermezzo moves, so everything is falling. So basically, after rook f7, he has to take on e3, queen e3. Again, king f7 is knight g5. Same idea, bishop d5 check and queen h3. Rook e4 is... Again, there's a million mates, like, takes it, play rook f1, bishop d5, queen h3, whatever. Just use your imagination. I mean, this guy, the black king is definitely getting mated. And finally, the key move after d5, which was very smart defense. I play queen g5. I saw this from afar. Yeah, so queen g5, the key idea, that's a mate threat. He can't take it because there's a killing attack again yeah and uh, essentially the position um simplified he played queen g5 knight g5 and 96 and after rook e5 i was able to win the game so the rest is not really important i mean this is of course really nice beautiful combination but you gotta understand how it started again it started with the space advantage uh by my opponent playing out the alekhine defense which hands on the platter obvious space advantage i grab it i have the space and this time i use the so-called backwards thinking like what does my opponent typically want he wants to play d5 he wants to play 97 knight f5 so bishop e4 came together with the move g4 because when i play bishop e4 i already anticipated that he's gonna play rook b8 because otherwise how else does he play d5 or knight f5 i mean he could have played queen d7 but he is not, not even closer by playing knight e7, knight f5. So, of course, I anticipated that rook b8 will be the move. And then g4, bishop g2. If you ask me, did I see from afar f4? No, I did not see a 4 at all. It was just an idea to take the f5 square, put the bishop on g2. I saw ideas like knight e4, g4. And basically from here, I just improvised. Right? I was not even sure from the very beginning, should I take on f6 or on g5? And then I felt, okay, this is a very good moment to start the attack. And then, of course, I saw before I, I mean, when I was calculating f4, I saw that there's this cute idea of rook f7. So I had just to calculate. But again, I mean, if you are not able to do this, you can, of course, just play knight g5 as well. Queen g5, you have two bishops, a beautiful center, and big advantage. Yeah, so this is, of course, still pretty nice. Something like rook e4 and white absolutely enjoys um, a strong position with two bishops in an open position. All right. Um, let's continue. I believe this game I already showed in one of my streams. And it should be also available. Thank you. Yeah, This should be also available on my YouTube channel. Uh, one of my greatest Catalan games against uh, the Danish chess legend Hansen Sonneberg. Uh, I was incredibly uh, uh, happy about the game because uh, Sonneberg is a great expert in a Catalan and I was able to beat him. Right, so again let, let's have a look at this position. So we enjoy a considerable space advantage. What is it? So we have the center which basically is the space advantage and our opponent is having some issues with his pieces the harmony is not great the bishop on d7 is pretty terrible the bishop on f8 is not doing much so we're thinking about starting a direct assault black has bad pieces exactly so our space advantage will be a catalyst to start a direct assault I mean, he has only a couple of defenders. So that's why the right idea here first is to make sure that he can't use the queen to defend the king. Bishop a2, bishop b1, this is what was played in the game, which is very human. But the stronger response was e5. Bishop d2 to shut off the queen from the game. And then play h4 queen e4 bishop d3 g6 h5 and rip apart black's defenses this is strategically losing for black 
Again, we're using the space advantage to start a direct assault. So he can't, he can't properly meet it. Every single move he's going to make it is going to weaken his defense. So I had the same idea, but I didn't really expect that Queen H5 is going to be such a strong defense. Meaning I missed from afar that after E5, Bishop B1, which I thought is really great because I had a feeling that the Queen on H5 is disconnected. I did not see from afar this very powerful pawn sacrifice and actually black is doing really great. So that's why I'm saying that this e5 idea may be thinking a bit backwards, trying to not allow the black queen to join the defense was smarter. But my opponent missed it. So I play bishop a2, he played b5, he missed it. Yeah, black has no pawn breaks. Exactly. Now I play bishop b1, this is a big threat. Direct attack. Queen d2, the pawn is under attack. g5 just weakens the king. Again, we use the pawn play at its finest. e5, h5, you see the king on h7 is under a pin uh, from the white slide square bishop. So he tried, of course, to organize something at the queen side. e5, um, yeah, knight e5, h5, this, this pin will kill black, so he can't do it. h5, h takes, and from here it was unstoppable attack. So, yeah, I won the game. In case you're interested, you can find this game uh, with full notation uh, on my YouTube channel. It was part of the series Inside the, Inside the Mind of a Grandmaster, but I, <laughs> to be honest, I don't remember uh, what was the title of the video. It's, it's definitely there. Um, all right. Yeah, maybe let me show you again some simpler examples like this one. So one of the one of the openings which maybe is not very obvious, but it very often features the elements of the space advantage. Those are the quiet Ray Lopez and Italian games, and there's probably a fair reason uh, why they're popular. Yeah, why? Why is this? Because we are fighting for the center. I mean, and the big part of um, establishing yourself a solid space advantage is you are fighting for the center. I mean, there's a very good reason why all of the chess coaches, they're saying you the same. So what you should do in the opening Fight for the center. I mean, your opponent doesn't want the center. Take it. Take it without thinking. I mean, have the two pawns on the central squares. E4, D4. Without thinking. The same applies for black. And if you control the center, you establish space advantage. You establish space advantage. It gives you better chances to start direct assault, which could be a catalyst for this direct attack. So why, why does here a bit faster? To play d4 so we are about to establish some space advantage we, we have the center um okay i mean maybe uh here my opponent anna by the way she's also a streamer a friend of mine uh she should have tried to um, not to release the tension should have played something like queen c7 rook e8 etc I could play bishop e3, queen c2, rook d1, and toy with the idea of playing d5 at the right moment. Again, using the space advantage. He just, she decided to give it up immediately. Takes, takes. Takes, takes. Queen d7. Now, since we have a pawn uh, majority at the king side, we have a beautiful center. We are already thinking about starting a direct assault at the king side. It is protected with two knights, obviously. But we could use some of the rearrangement of the pieces. So we start with queen c2. The queen is getting closer to the king. Rook e8. I mean, again, if you think backwards, what do you think your opponent wants to do? What do you think your opponent is cooking up here? 
probably is going to be some kind of a poor move so if there is no uh, actual response from black and black remains very static we also want to make sure we are using our pawns our center properly to gain even more space so that's why there is this small bishop e3 the idea is to play knight e2 f4 or maybe i don't know knight f3 or f5 immediately establish a strong pawn center of course anna was not in the mood to wait for it she played e5 e5 so we already have the space advantage here at the king side knight h7 i guess anticipating at some point to play um f6 and now after knight f5 black starts to experience some major problems with knight e6 so again she followed the rule that the typical king's attack is supposed to be responded with the counter strike in the center so c5 does make sense hitting the pawn on e5 but after knight e6 white makes an intermezzo move the pawn on c5 now can't be taken so after a couple of complications c takes bishop d4 bishop d4 black decided to give up the exchange and eventually lost this game so again maybe not exactly the brightest example but again you're gonna see that very often um very often the success starts by grabbing the center thinking about starting a potential kings at attack so the idea is to play knight e2 f4 knight f3 e5 f5 etc and then uh, because we control the center we get access to more squares meaning here knight e6 is a problem and suddenly it's very difficult to defend for example if you play bishop b8 how about i could play um bishop d2 i think this looks uh, very logical you see suddenly black is feeling quite cramped and after 97 i think you can already come up with an answer yourself what would you play here based on your understanding So black wants to trade the knights, play f6, open up the rooks, they're going to be pretty active. If you are black, I'm sure you would love to trade. <clears throat> if we say no to the trade, black plays f6, he's doing okay. Knight g7, oh, knight g7 is a bit too much. Knight h6 yeah but then we lose all the space advantage even though i mean this will be a good material gain but black is pretty active like we the five we have nothing left from the space advantage i mean actually black's two minor pieces are pretty great so we're tr trying to use the space advantage since f6 is a problem how about how about we play g4 exactly yeah i see such inside you already said uh g4 there's no g6 the pawn on h6 is under attack and knight f5 we don't trade the queens I w i'm still thinking about the direct attack at the king side so i mean how do you deal with these pawns on e5 f5 the knight on h7 is dead right f6 probably e6 so let's say queen e6 looks really dangerous but again the question is how exactly is your opponent planning to exploit this let's say knight g5 this is a problem play h4 there's no checks no checks no checks if you feel threatened you can play king f1 the king is feeling secure black's knight on h7 is dead uh, g6 just exposes the king even further the pawn on h6 is under attack and the pawn on e6 is a monster even bishop b4 at the right moment could be making a big difference so this pawn this move g4 uh, doesn't allow black to activate the pieces and look at those rooks they're really feeling claustrophobic so if we do, would not do this or we would trade here or let's say make some okay let's not blunder bishop b4 let's like queen e7 and um whatever let's say you play i don't know bishop c3 suddenly we have no space advantage left 
and black is just fine. So clearly we did something wrong. All right. Um, so obviously a big question very often is when to trade and when not to trade. And since we're talking about Italian and Raul Lopez games, let me move on. So I would like to show you a very famous game, at least a part of it, which is the 12 world champion Anatoly Karpov playing against Wolfgang Gunziker. And a very famous idea in the Raul Lopez if you get to play Raul Lopez, is the following mod e5, which maybe from a certain point of view doesn't make any sense, because white re relieves any tension from the center. But then again, you look at the position more closely and start to realize not only you have a space advantage, the pawn on d5 is making these pieces pretty passive. But very often in the Raul Lopez, black is experiencing big issues with the knight. So again, if we try to picture some scenario where black is able to remove a couple of pieces of the board, you know what I'm going to say? I'm going to say trade the knights, trade the bishops, and black is doing fantastic. Yeah, so he's going to play bishop d7, g6, knight h5, f5, or he's going to play bishop d7, a5, b4, etc, etc, etc. But obviously, he can't do that. He would love to, but he can't do that. So he played knight e8. His idea was to play knight b7, c4, knight c5, put the knight on c5. I mean, try to activate it. Carp played a4, trying to open up the a file, since black has not ideal uh, harmony of the pieces. Takes, takes, and now let's think backwards. Let's think like Karpov. How are you going to meet Black's idea c4, knight b7, and knight c5? Think about this. And the way you're going to think about this, you're going to realize everything else is much less, like the typical move, knight f1, knight g3, or whatever. Yeah, I guess knight f1, knight g3 would be the obvious move. How do you deal with knight b7, c4, knight c5? Because you treat this knight on d8 is something which you could exploit. c4, you're opening up the queen side for the rook. Although you make this knight look bad, you're also making the pawn on b2 a slight weakness. There's actually two moves. Very good, Domjant. Very good. So it's b4. Why? Yeah, b3 actually is working just fine. b3 is also good. This is also good. I like it. It's a very typical move in the Raul Lopez. But after b4, I think if we can do it immediately, we should do it. Because we make sure this knight is imprisoned. It's not going anywhere. And also with the move of b4, we fix the pawn on b5 as a weakness. So Karpov establishes himself solid space advantage. This is a nightmare scenario for black. Onsikor play knight b7. And bishop d7. So imagine this. Onsikor is playing this position. And he's like, I'm doing okay. I mean, why should I be doing badly? I mean, I have okay pawn structure here. Yeah, I have positioned the pieces, I have brought them out, I'm about to play rook e8, and I'm about to play a king's head attack with knight h5 and 5. So, what's, what's so bad about this? The problem is the knight and the bishop. That's a big problem. Hey, Richie. Appreciate that for the sub, thank you. So, bishop e3, queen d2, so the fight for the a file goes on. So black is, you know, getting ready. I'm going to trade every single piece there is at the A file. And then maybe at some point play knight e8, f6, knight f7, give this knight uh, some freedom. 
it's not so bad, so it would seem. So bishop b3, knight g3, bishop phase, so black is rearranging the pieces. Rook a2, so white is trying to take over the a file, and now c4. Finally, black had it enough. The pawn on b5 is getting hammered. Bishop b1, queen d8, and black is about to play rook a2, rook a8, and trade off the pieces. Yeah, I see that Richie already knows the famous move. But why? Do you understand why Karpov played bishop a7? Obviously, this is one of the most famous moves of Karpov. But do you understand why he did this? How he even came up with the concept of playing bishop a7? What's so special about not trading the rooks? That's why we have to go back. I'll talk a bit about the rules of space advantage. You have to understand what black wants to achieve. He is lacking space. White has space. So what do you think he wants to do? He wants to trade this rook. He doesn't do much. This rook on c8 doesn't do much. He wants to put the other rook on a8. Trade this guy as well. Maybe even trade queens. And everything is locked. Right? With bishop a7, we make sure he's feeling claustrophobic. Look at this. I mean, this rook, no moves. This rook, no moves. Okay, rook c7. Queen is really limited. The knight on b7 already is dead. The bishop on d7 doesn't do much. The bishop on f8 is terrible. So, actually, black is about to reach a position where he has physically no moves. And that's what makes this bishop a7 so strong that Karpov recognizes that this position is uh, clearly driven by the space advantage and he makes sure his opponent cannot trade off these pieces. So he's strictly following the rule. If you have space advantage, what do you do? You do not trade pieces. If your opponent is lacking space, what do you think he wants to do? He wants to trade pieces. I mean, I think I used already this example that you push 10 people in a very narrow uh, basement. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be a lot of space. Everybody wants to get out, right? So I, I think Black is feeling really cramped in this position. So Carpa played Bishop C2. He played rook a1, queen e7, and now the most important question is, now what? Now what? Yeah, so, okay, he improved the pieces, etc., but now what? So, okay, you, you control the a file. Great, awesome, congratulations. But now what do you do next? And this is where you remember what... I started to talk about, about half an hour ago, what space advantage allows you to do. It allows you to facilitate a direct attack. So Karpov uses this opportunity that he controls the A file, the bishop on A7 is ready to jump at any moment and take over the A file. So Karpov brings in yet another element to this position, which is the king's attack. He starts with knight e2, knight h2, f4 is incoming. How do you deal with this? All the bootcamp videos are available on my YouTube channel. They're free. They're free. They cost you nothing. So... Yeah, black lay bishop g7, f4. If a black takes an e4, this knight gets access to some critical squares. So d4 square, black cannot take on e4. He played f6. Karpov really loved this idea of f5. I have them in the playlist. Exactly. And now he starts to take care of weaknesses. Out of queen side. I mean, look at this position. It's just 
nightmare. And you know, in this position, Onzakar simply resigned. He simply resigned because, I mean, he's basically paralyzed. The bishop on g7 is under attack. He can't take on g6. Knight f5 is incoming. Uh, bishop b6 is incoming at some point. So he played bishop a7 and he never moved. One of the greatest games which um, features the proper use of the space advantage. Yes, of course, here I think I should have mentioned that there was no bishop h5 and queen h5 because of knight f6. Yes. So it was a small trick. Karpov didn't miss this. Maybe he could have avoided it. Yeah, he could have played like bishop f7 immediately, then played knight g4, knight e3. It doesn't really matter. So he used a small tactical uh, trick to get what he wants positionally. Okay. Since we're talking about the classics, that in the space advantage, what do you want to do when you have space advantage? You don't want to trade and your opponent wants to trade. Let me show you the next game by the legendary Jose Raul Capablanca. Um, Former world champion number three. Yeah, the third world champion. Yeah, I always mix up third and fourth. Yeah, so he was the third. Alekhan was the fourth. And Capablanca, of course, the great Cuban player, one of the arguably greatest talents in chess. Uh, he was an exceptionally brilliant positional player. So he reached this position uh, against Carl Trebel. Um, white enjoys a beautiful knight on e5, but it's not enough. I mean, black has literally built a rock solid fortress. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that this was still played in the era when it was believed that you can successfully defend the position passively. This kind of mindset has changed no longer there is a belief that you can defend your positions passively but you can't really blame treble because this was the understanding of that time okay i'm not entirely sure maybe already in the 20s closer to the 30s of the 20th century maybe already had the change of the mindset so alekhan changed a lot right but it was believed that if i put up like a very very passive but solid position then i'm gonna hold it i mean nowadays nobody defends like that nobody i mean it it is very often believed that the best defense is active defense and if you have to uh, sacrifice a pawn to get activity so kappa has the knight on e5 he needs more space what do you think he does he takes space b4 the idea is really simple. B5, C5, B5, expand on the queen side. So, bishop E8, rook C1. White is thinking about some sort of advancement here. A6, queen F2. Okay, this was over slightly mysterious to me. Now, what do you do? 97, play like a Blanca. h3 so what did we talk about the rules of the space advantage we don't trade pieces when the opponent is cramped of course knight of three we need this knight i mean you might argue i mean okay fine let him trade allow him to play knight e5 f takes on e5 but we are the dominating side and we can always trade this knight on e5 if you want and uh I'm actually liking that his pieces are feeling a bit cramped here. And I can always go knight of three later back if I have to. Rook c8, c5. You know, with modern understanding, I think that Treble would have tried to open up the position somewhere at the queen side. If he did not understand it. c5, a4, h3. So Capablanca is controlling the action at the queen side. He takes space at the king side. Hey, look at this g4. 
somebody might be like really concerned. Are we not weakening the king? Again, remember who is going to exploit it. He has no pieces, even close to the king. We can use these pawns for proper effect. Rook c2, rook g2. So Kappa is, you know, hinting there might be a potential king set attack. He's thinking about h4, h5. And now something incredible happens. Even more space. G5. Unbelievable. So he starts to squeeze black in earnest. So G5, H4. Black is completely helpless. H5. Black cannot take it. It would weaken the king completely. No rush. Queen C3, King F2, Rook H1. And just when black is ready to rearrange his pieces, Queen A1, Queen A3, and Capablanca is looking for the final killing blow. There you go. B5 finally works with a key idea. H6. Shut off those rooks from the game. Take on B5. You can't take on B5. C6. Discover. Check. And finally, I mean, Capablanca was such a beast. Oh my goodness. I mean, look at Black's position. He's completely tied. Poor knight on f7. Poor bishop on d7. They're not doing anything. Now the rooks are getting lifted to the queen side. Here. All Capablanca does, he makes sure he's not missing any counter-strike like knight e5 or e5 because no matter how great is your position, make sure you're not underestimating, underestimating your opponent's counterplay. So Kappa spends some time, you know, trying to figure out where the king best position, king g3, king g2. Okay, finally he figured out the king best stands on g2. And now the knight goes to a5. Very picturesque position, is it not? Except it doesn't hold. That's it. Black collapses. No way he can hold his pawn. Rook d7. And that's it. Gone. And black immediately collapses. So maybe what I should explain is this concept. Which is very famous. Right here. That we are moving the weight of the position from the pawn on c6 to the pawn on b7 and um, by definition it will be much more difficult for black to defend the pawn on b7 because of guess what space advantage he doesn't have it he doesn't have space because after b takes some b takes he would have more squares to operate with his pieces that's why this is a very famous idea you move the weight of the position the pressure so the further point of the position. So black was unable to hold this game. Yeah, probably, I, again, I show this uh, critical position. Do you remember why we say the trade on e5 tonight? This is the moment why we need it. You don't have the knight. You might have difficulties to make a progress. So it could be that also this was one of the games which essentially changed the attitude that you can't hold these positions passively. Okay. Now let me show you something modern. Uh, Black just played 97. The game of David Navarra against Rolf Mamedov. But to be honest, I could have easily shown my games as well. Uh, why is this? Because this is the Morozzi bind. Morozzi bind means pawns on e c4, e4, f3 against the pawn on d6. I have a special bootcamp video about the Morozzi bind. And actually, I think if you're watching this bootcamp, it uh, would be a great idea for you to combine it with the Morozzi Ban because in the Morozzi Ban it was one of the 
First, the boot camps I did, I talk about the space advantage. And one of the main reasons why we're setting up the Morat Siban is to, again, gain space and make sure that your opponent cannot improve. So, again, a lot of backwards thinking here. So, black just played knight e7. If white is the move, must play bishop e3. Yes, Richie, but why? Do you understand why it is bishop e3? Of course, it's bishop e3. It's a very famous maneuver in this position. Uh, ignoring this very strong bishop, and it kind of makes no sense. But when we look at this position more closer, we realize that black has major difficulties with the pawn play. Meaning, a4 is b4. There is no b5. There is no d5. There is no e6, d5. e6, the pawn is weak. If he plays f5, we take it and we transpose the weight of the position to the pawn on e7. So ultimately, we play bishop e3 to limit him of the pawn play. Once again, a4 is b4. But again, why? Why we do this? What should black do against space advantage? First, not allow it. Second, trade pieces. And this is exactly what Mamedov was trying to do. Of course, this is a highly theoretical position. So if you play rook b1, or let's say, okay, whatever, rook d1, rook d1, I just develop the piece centrally, and I don't know, I'm trying to do something there. I'm going to trade it and play queen b6. You're like, okay, great. I'm trading the queens. I have space, right? But what do you do next? For example, I go here. And I'm thinking about the idea like playing e5, f5, bring the king to e7. And black's ambition here is make white suffer because of the supposedly bad last square bishop. Now you know why black does this. So he secures himself a nice outpost on d4, c5 for his knight. Although, by the way, this position is still okay for white. I think that there's no need for you to do this. Maybe even f6 is more accurate. f6, bishop e8, bishop f7, or king f7, rook d8, e5, king e7, f5, etc. All of this is pretty common. And this bishop on e2 is not doing much. So, we play bishop e3. Also, the bishop is crucial in endgame. Right. Yeah, we be, we keep a better control to dark squares, Richie. So what happened here? Look at this. So knight c5, queen b6. So black is thinking about queen b4, a4. All of this I talk about in my bootcamp episode about the Morozzi bind. This position is there. I remember it clearly. Rook c8, uh, rook c2, queen b4, and queen c1. So essentially, white has set up a position to anticipate black's a4, which now loses due to a3, b4. Queen b6, king h1, h5. So, in order to understand this position a bit better, it's important to understand how pawn play works, which I already said to you. a4 is b4. There's no b5, there's no d5. e6 weakens the pawn on d6. F5, white takes it and weakens the pawn on e7. So, what Mamedov tries to do, he tries to, you know, initiate some sort of a king's attack pawn play, and he's thinking about queen d8, queen f8, and play bishop h6. Insist on the bishop trade. Also, king h7, queen d8, queen f8, and trade the bishops. So, it's a long way. Why king h1 and not king f1? Well, I don't know, because the king is feeling safer there. <laughs> not on f1, really. But I, I, I'm not sure. I think actually bishop f1 is a typical move for the bishop. Bishop f1, g3, bishop h3, and the king of f1 would make this maneuver impossible. So, yeah, a3 was immediately played by Navara. Queen d2, gaining space, bishop f1, queen f8, b4, not f4. All right, and now it's your chance to shine. What do you do?
What rules play in this position? That was pretty quick, right? Of course, 92. No, 95, no. You don't want to trade pieces. So if you play 95, I take with a bishop. Queen d5 is knight c3 fork. Uh, c takes on d5 is knight c3. Knight is very strong there. And e takes on d5, I guess, is b5. Pretty much the same idea. C takes on b5, knight c3. There's some dynamics. The knight is a monster, etc., etc. Yeah, okay, maybe it even works, but I don't know. Actually, it looks pretty suspicious from the white's perspective. So we play 92. Yeah, 92 was the reason for bishop f1. And uh, also, look at this. I did tell you that space advantage very often is the catalyst for a direct attack. And if you go back to this position, black is suffering space advantage. He would love to trade the bishops. He would love to trade the queens. And in order to... Um, facilitate these trades what he's doing he's weakening the king as already said his idea is to play king h7 queen d8 queen f8 bishop h6 to trade the bishops trade the queens but by doing this he is also weakening the king so navara is gaining space he makes sure that he already anticipates black's knight a4 he keeps the more pieces on the board uh, and he is ready to go after the black king so this is exactly how the game progressed. Bishop d7, knight f4, queen h8. So here Mamedov was trying to do something with those weaknesses. Knight e5, uh, finally black played e6 because the knight on d5 is so annoying. Knight f4, knight h3, and Navara started the, started the direct attack. A couple of moves later, the game was pretty sharp and he felt this is the moment to start to rip apart Black's defenses. You know, the rest of this game, I won't show you, but you gotta, again, appreciate the logic that White was doing. Again, it's always the same, it's always the same. So you establish space advantage, you decline the trades, because you know that your opponent lacks space, and while your opponent is trying to solve the problems of the space advantage, you are looking for the opportunity to start a direct assault. Let me show you a simpler example. Again, about the trade. So, an opening. Some Pirts of Imtsev. By the way, one of the reasons why Pirts is not a great opening. Because it just hands you the center on the platter. You can do whatever you want. And especially if you're a skilled player in space advantage, this can be costly to black. So before we start with our move, try to think backwards. Um, this is one of my favorite topics. Try to think backwards. What do you think black wants to do? Think about it. I mean, before you make your next move, before you play... Um, before you play uh, h3, before you play rook e1, before you play queen d2, I mean, try to understand what does he want. I use this very often. So one of the core ideas for black, since this looks like some sort of a king's Indian defense position or pirts, yes, he wants to play e5. So if you play h3, he's going to take it. He's going to play e5. Well, if you take it, he takes with a pawn, he has 94, the bishop on f3 is not really great. Pretty common mistake, by the way, by many players. And if you play d5, he plays 97, 97, f5. Yeah, and uh, I guess black is okay. This last square bishop is traded, so black is not gonna experience some claustrophobic feelings. So f5, I don't know, g5, although white is doing okay, 
Black's game is very straightforward. So one of the core ideas of the Kings in a defense. So this is what he wants. So why would we want to play h3? So what do we do? We take space. Why not? We play d5. If black would play knight e5, we trade it. And this is instantly slightly better for white. The bishop on g7 is worse. It's staring at a pawn. We have space. We could play queen b5, a4, a5, try to establish targets on the queen side. And we just watch out for e6, I guess. And that's it. So instantly uh, sole position with an advantage. Now we trade. I guess we do. I mean, alternatively, you could consider also uh, decline. But remember what I said to you about the rules. I said to you that every single rule or these great practices, they have um, an exception. Yes. So I did say when you are having space advantage, you don't trade. Yeah, you, you don't trade. But we get to transpose from a position where we have the space advantage to a position where we still have the space advantage. But the bishop is pretty terrible. He has double pawns and we have some easy targets at the queen side. So we transition from one form of advantage into another, which maybe is a topic for another bootcamp. <laughs> yeah, it's... If chess was so easy, I could explain you everything in two hours. <laughs> and everybody would go out there and start to be grandmasters. Unfortunately, it's not so easy. But I'm just trying to uh, <laughs> come up with the uh, core ideas. It will work for you most of the time. So, I mean, we are going to get there when to trade and when not to trade. Right now, right now you have a choice. Knight on e5 is such a beautiful knight. Do you allow the knight trade for the bishop or not? So we have space, we have the two bishops. I mean, we could again look at uh, the two bishop advantage. I believe, I think I, I think I did a boot camp about it as well some, some time ago. Two bishops, why they're so important. So we decline. We don't trade the bishops. We keep the space advantage. We want to keep those knights on the board. So he played c6, f4. Yeah, first d takes on c6, f4 also was okay. f4 doesn't really matter. This order with the most is the same. Bishop f3, beautiful bishops. We're thinking about getting space advantage, kicking away the knight, g4, g5. Rook b8, rook b1, we're being careful what we're doing at the queen side. Queen a5, queen d2, knight, uh, yeah, rook e8 first, king h1. We're making sure that there's no points of penetration. d5, e5, we are starting a king set attack. It's getting really risky for black. So he played knight a4, trade of the pieces, which we probably can't. Uh, decline. Hello, Justin Earth. Doing great. Thank you. Running bootcamp. And uh, now we can't decline it because the pawn on b2 is under attack. So we trade it. Play b3. This queen would be lost. He could have taken the pawn on a2. And we continue gaining even more space. Push away the queen. And one thing we know about. Uh, one, one thing we know about the space advantage, try to get more pawns to join your cause. Because black might play d5 at the right moment to activate his pieces. d5, e5, 97 now a direct attack might not work. So we play c4. And we play b4. Look at this. Brilliant. So we control everything that's happening at a, a queen side. We control what's happening at a king side. And most importantly, black has no pawn play. Yeah, so there's no c5, d5, e5. All of the moves come with some sort of a concession. And probably already around here, we can think about starting a direct assault. I'm thinking about ideas like h4, h5. I mean, why not? 
Now we could use this space advantage to facilitate a direct attack. Actually, here specifically, there's also the c5 move. And uh, the knight on d7 is not enough protected. So queen a6, queen c2, rook c1. Yeah, black was seeking some counterplay. And finally, he did not... Uh, he did not really have any patience. And now after a5, finally, white starts the attack at the king side. Black attempted to change something, but his position after c5 collapsed. Yeah. Okay, queen b7 technically was a blunder, but you, you should already sense that his position is getting dangerous. So g4, g5, h4, h5, f6 maybe, bishop g4. We have two bishops. We have space advantage when you have those things. Good things are about to happen. We are not weakening the king because precisely who is going to attack it? Precisely. I mean, who is going to attack it right here? For example, he would play, um, I don't know, whatever, uh, rook d8, I don't know. So we play g4. How exactly is he planning to exploit this? With what? It's feeling very secure. It has beautiful pieces here protecting it. The bishops. Okay, of course we need to watch out for some sort of counterplay with d5. So maybe g4 is not really so great. So I need to make some improving move first. Maybe actually something like c5, takes, takes, and something like bishop e2, bishop c4. Uh, not overly focus on this king side attack, but use the two bishops. Again, depends on the occasion. All right. Okay, you're going to love this. Now that you're so smart. Black misplayed the opening. He just played knight g5. I'm giving you a chance to shine. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, instantly, yeah? Instantly knight e5. So why don't we trade? It seems an equal trade. Well, I don't think so. I mean, actually, I think that the knight on g5 is clearly misplaced. So if he would trade it, for example, like this, and play something like rook e1, I mean, black is okay. There's even a bishop h3 somewhere incoming. The pawn on d4 is a weakness. So why would we want to trade? So knight e5, easy move. I mean, I do believe in the rule that... If one of the central squares for your pieces is available, use it. So in ID5, the best places for your pieces are these four squares. So in ID5, bishop e6, now what? What are you going to do? Especially with IQP, right? Uh, can black play 97? I think... I think it tactically fails because of this. I'm not entirely sure. I think this fails. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, that's what it looks like. Because black is underdeveloped. So the threat is bishop f7, queen g5. So you would have to play g6. I probably take it on queen h7. I think with such a weak king, queen g6 is also incoming, f4, f5 is incoming, this should be a win. You know, I'm not entirely sure about this, but uh, this idea of knight f7, queen h5, and uh, queen h7 is always there. So black play bishop e6 instead. So what do you do? So he makes sure this, this trick of knight f7 doesn't work and he wants to trade pieces. Bishop d3. <clears throat> Actually, there is a, a better move. Also notice that black is about to make... He needs just one move. 
Yeah, maybe. Maybe it requires a grandmaster. I don't know. <laughs> to me, it's to me it's easy, but uh, I mean, it's not. You know, actually, this entire idea it's not even a sacrifice because it's an equal trade, basically, right? I mean, it's two minor pieces for the rook and a pawn, and it follows the logic that you're opening up the position when you're having better development. So it's like pretty equal trade, actually. So queen h5, keep the pin alive, nothing really difficult. Although, of course, normally, most like knight f7, they're pretty bad. Because, unfortunately, uh, too many players tend to evaluate the two minor pieces. They give them higher priority than the rook. It's not always the case. Yes, d5. So we use space to our advantage. Black needs one move to finish his development. He needs 94, one move to finish development. And here, white could have finished off the game immediately. H4. Again, big scare. How can you play like this? We're weakening the king. The pawns are supposed to protect the pawn. Yeah, sure, but where does the knight go? Takes, takes, and we already know the following idea. Rook e1, bishop e5, black needs one move. One move. But he doesn't have it. You already know the motive. King f7 is d6, super easy. Discover check. And rook f7, d6, the same idea, basically. We are not even sacrificing anything, so it's an equal trade. And let's say bishop d6... That's it. Yeah, king h5, queen f5. It's uh, lights out. And uh, let's say if um, black would play queen d6, I think there should be a win. Like, take it. The threat is rook e7, use the pin. And this somehow should be winning. What if c takes on d6? What do you mean? Here? But it's the same, no? I don't think what changes. I don't, I don't see what changes really. So again, king g6, h5. And we actually use the fact that the pawn stands on h4. So you're just winning a lot of things. So, but in the game, uh, why I didn't notice this? That was me. So I played g4, which looks very bold, but again, we're using the space advantage. Uh, we are not allowing any unnecessary trades. The threat is to play a four win a piece. Bishop d6. F4. King g2 and white enjoys significant space advantage. Again, this could be really risky because it feels that we are overextending the pawns in front of the king. But because of the knight on g5, we are making an exception. So bishop e5, f takes on e5, we have strong center, the king's safety, again, the question is, how does he plan to exploit this? So he managed to play a5, there was nothing better, and after queen d4, white still had a solid advantage, although it was no longer winning. Why king g2? Because king g2 enables the threat of um, h4. <laughs> Uh, if you play h4 immediately, there's this check. And uh, king g2 makes sure that uh, there's no checks. It, it, it uh, deals with any knight h3 ideas. It deals with any bishop c5 ideas as well, right? So king g2 just covered the weaknesses that we created. I mean, I totally get it. This is really advanced. It, it, it is in the walls that you play g4 f4 here actively push the pawns in front of the king but again you should appreciate that it gives you the chance to generate space advantage at the king side right and the question is can your opponent somehow use this for example okay definitely h4 trade in rookie one was instantly killing when out of seven but even this idea is very nice because he's losing so many tempi, so many tempi that it's worth it.
All right. Now let me show you one more example. So after bishop e6, what do you mean? Here? Trade, trade, and queen b3. I don't know, maybe there's queen c8. Maybe it's winning, I don't know. But somehow I tried not to uh, give a higher priority uh, for a pawn. Yeah, d5. I don't know, maybe it works, you know, I mean, I could play knight a6 and take it and knight c5, maybe it works. But uh, to be honest, it just somehow looks worse compared to what we looked at. Because there's no space advantage here anymore and if black survives after knight a6, he's just fine. But okay, maybe it works as well. Another, another Alekhan game. Uh, I play this game against a good friend of mine, a person I uh, really respected. Why in the past form, unfortunately, Aloysius Kvenis passed away in 2018, if I remember correctly. So he was a good friend of mine. Um, of a different generation, but um, somehow we always found a very easy language together. So he was also mentoring me um, and uh, invited me to play in in France. And I mean, basically, all of the uh, grandmasters from the Baltic countries they uh, they're really good relations. Uh, together because Aloysius, he's from Lithuania, a uh, really well-known grandmaster. I'm, I'm Latvian myself, so three Baltic countries, Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. But for some reason, Aloysius, he decided to play against me in this Capella Lagrande Open Tournament back in 2016, Alekhan. <laughs> well, at the time, he did not know that you are not supposed to play Alekhan against me. <laughs> because, I mean, I know it really well. And I'm a big fan of Space Advantage. So right now, Black has just played e5. And you already know what's going to be our response. It's pretty obvious. We want to play c5, gain space. There's no knight e7 because the pawn on d5 is under attack. So it's got to be knight c8. And something you probably remember from my game versus Dennis Boros, which I showed earlier in this bootcamp. We know that black wants to play knight e7 and bishop e5. So we make sure it doesn't happen. So we start with h3. There's no bishop h5. This is a double attack. Pretty known trick, by the way. So after bishop g6, we will just take on g6 and collect the pawn on d5. So it cannot be done. After take it, take it, black plays a5. So why do you think he does this? Why do you think black plays a5? Outpost, you think? Also, we keep a close eye on this knight on c8 because logically its only future plan is to go on a5. So make sure we don't miss this move. <laughs> I am not going to play a3. Well, Richie, what do you think is today's topic? How do we claim even greater space advantage? Remember Capablanca's game? How Capablanca against Treble made progress? So black is trying to avoid b4. Well, we insist on it. The idea is to play b4, b5. We want to squeeze black, right? So what, he, what he's supposed to do? I'm not really sure. So he played knight e7, I play b4. I want to play b5. Again, he's lacking space. Look at this. He would love to get rid of the knights. Like, 
Remove pair of knights from the board or the bishops from the board. Ideally, the bishop and the knight. So that this knight can go to e7. He can't do that. So he traded here, played queen c8, b5, considerable space advantage for white already. We keep an eye on knight f5. Let's not forget this. The a file doesn't matter at the moment. Queen c3 are about to take it over. g6. Knight f4, activating the knight, killing the pawn. There's no knight f5. There's knight e5. c6. Stopping knight f5 again. By the way, it was very interesting to consider switching the weight of the position. Like in Capablanca's game against Treble with b6. But the thing about b6, Black was able to play knight f5. And I think this is a bit too much because Black is able to successfully depend upon on b7. We have nothing to attack it. And actually, we should be a bit careful what happens at the king side. So, queen c2. Yeah, th there's not enough pieces to hit upon on b7 exactly. So he took it because he's afraid that b6 might happen. It might happen still. I mean, switch the weight from the pawn on c6 to the pawn on b7. So he takes on b5, although it ruins his pawn structure. Knight to c6. Now another improving move. The pawn on d4 is under attack. Rook a4. The rook is active here. The rook is fighting for the a file. Rook d8. Now, what do you do? How do you stop knight f5? We already know the move. Right, we already know the move. g4, we take care of this knight. It doesn't go to f5. And maybe the logic is, but wait, what about weakening the king? I mean, are we not weakening the king? And always the question is going to be the same. How does he plan to exploit this? So he played queen d7, queen b3, trying to apply even more pressure against these pawns. h5, there you go, he tries to do this. But the bishop goes back. I keep the control of that five square. Takes it, takes it. Nobody's bothering the king. The pawn on g4 serves a very important function. We can actually put the bishop here on f3, apply even greater pressure against the pawn on d5. So Aloysius was suffering here for a long time. He was uh, trying to find some resources. I mean, trying to be tricky. Knight g2, make sure this doesn't happen. He sought some counterplay. Still not easy to crash through. And eventually, black's position started to become more and more difficult. The pawn on d5 is really weak. And after a lot of maneuvers, I had achieved a winning position, but I was unable to convert it. So the game finished ultimately in a draw. But again, I would like to go back to this critical moment. After queen c2. So we deal with knight f5 threat. I mean, knight f5, we take with f5. You would say, but wait a second, we are not supposed to trade the pieces, right? Yes, but this is an exception. We completely ruined his pawn structure. We can play rook a7. We can generate targets there. Pawn on f5 maybe is dead. So we are transposing uh, from one form of advantage into another. So that's why black doesn't play knight f5. If he doesn't play knight f5, I'm either playing g4 next or b6 and transpose the weight to the pawn on b7. So Quainis perfectly understands what he's doing. He understands that b6 might be a problem. So he deals with this in order to activate his pieces. But by doing this, he creates a weakness on d5. You understand? I mean, just is so linked together all of these rules they're linked together so by dealing with one problem he creates another problem so i'm still following strictly of the rules of the space advantage not allowing knight f5 
And finally, in the endgame, here, in the endgame, right here, he's still suffering because of this weakness on d5. Yeah, these exceptions. I hope I'm not speaking Chinese here, that at least I get to explain something. All right. Um, now, the final part of this bootcamp will be early side pawn pushes. So I would like to talk about this for a moment. Uh, this also probably will be in my upcoming book about the pawn play. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Why sometimes in an opening early side pawn pushes is a great idea. This is my game again. Yeah, I, you know, sorry that I'm using most of my games. Uh, the reason is really simple. I know them the best. <laughs> and I managed to play a lot of instructive games. So if I have to show you an instructive game, very often I just use my games because I, I can instantly select. I know what I have played and I have already sorted them. I could, of course, do the same and show you, for example, Magnus's uh, game. So no problem. So I'm playing here against Latvian chess legend Edwin Kengis, who is also widely regarded as a great chess coach. And Edwin has been many times Latvian champion. Um, also has been in top 100 in the world in his best days. Right now he's a coach, he's retired. And a couple of years ago I had an opportunity to play against him. So um, the subtopic of this line will be how we are going to use aggressive side pawn push in the opening to gain benefits. Now, let's have a look at this position. To be honest, I'm going to tell you a secret. I know nothing of this opening. I mean, my opponent played uh, in the Italian game an early h6 and d6. And I know nothing about this. And uh, when, I, when I play this, I mean, obviously, I have a uh, huge experience in the Italian and Raul Lopez games, but I don't know anything about this, but I, I can still make logical decisions based on how I treat chess. So what's the move we start with is a4. Why a4? Because one of the black's ideas why he plays d6, he wants to trap the bishop, which often in Raul Lopez and Italian games is one of the critical pieces. So if you are actually um, studying some Ray Lopez uh, and probably most importantly the Italian game, you're going to notice that the attention has shifted in all kinds of Italians from C3 to all kinds of A4s. And why is this? Because with the development of the modern chess engines, the Silicon Beast, it, it shows us that not only it's important to secure an escape route for the bishop, but at the same time we are grabbing something. So we play a four, we secure an escape route on a two exactly, and we're thinking about grabbing more. You might be thinking, but but why? What's the purpose? I mean, why can't I develop the pieces? Why can't I play? Knight c3, rook e1, h3, bishop e3, queen d2, etc. Play normal chess. So why are you saying that uh, a4? You know, the key answer is, and this is what I very often say to my students, is you do not have information where to position those pieces. You do not know where to put the rook. I mean, okay, maybe it's e1, or maybe it's on f1. You do not know where to put the bishop. Are you sure it's on e3? What about d2? What about on b2? What about the knight on b1? 
Are you sure it goes to C3? Or it goes to D2? Are you sure it's uh, rookie 1, 92, 94, 9, G3 and he plays G6? What the, what's it doing there? So the core idea, very often in many openings, why it's getting so popular to grab space so quickly with A4, A5, H4, H5, there's many openings which feature it. You're seeking information very early. And by playing A4, we, are, we want to get some answers. For example, let's say, let's say black plays A5. We get our first answer. We get a potential target on A5. So now I suspect I could play something at a queen side. So I could play maybe, I was thinking, I'm not sure how good is this. I was thinking about ideas like knight C3. I was thinking about idea like knight E5. So let's say you take it. I was thinking about e takes on e5, knight b8, and maybe in some lines I can use the spawn on a5 as a potential target. Okay, here specifically I think I could play something like d4. d4, knight e4, I maybe not use the pawn on a5 as a target, but I have established myself an outpost on b5. Okay, maybe not very likely to happen, but I feel that including a4, a5, I have gained something. Or maybe there could be a different scenario. Let's say black plays a5. I could choose a different setup. For example, I'm playing knight e2. Let's say black plays g6 according to the plan. I play c3, bishop g7. How about we are considering the ideas to play at a queen set? How about b4? Now, if we had not included a4, a5, this maybe would not be a thing. So the point is, takes, takes, knight b4 is queen b3. If he doesn't do that, he plays something like a castle. We could play b5. We, again, once again, fight for the space advantage. So I have a feeling that this a4, a5 gives us more options. It gives us information in more scenarios. Yes, a lot of engines, they love these side bomb pushes in many openings. What do you think all the elite players, they get their ideas from? So what happened in this particular game? So I played a4. King is decided to ignore this. He played G, g5. Okay, g5, fine. It's a choice. I mean, he could have played also g6. He could have played bishop e7. Remember what I told you? It, I need information. This is information. So I play a5. I gain space. I will have a better understanding where to position my pieces. So he plays a6. I mean, a6, bishop b5, or bishop d5 in some lines could be a problem. So he's not entirely sure about this. So he plays a6. But uh, why should I be worried about g4? What's so special about it? I mean, he plays g4, he plays h5, he plays h4, he plays g3. You know, very often what I'm saying to my students is, what are you afraid of? What do you think your opponent will attack you with? With two pawns? Where do you think this opponent's king is going to go? At a queen side? Why do you think we position the pawn on a5 for that? Think about this. So in order to start a successful king set attack with something like h5, h4, g3, etc., the king cannot remain in the center. So he needs bishop e6, queen e7, long castle. Guess what? We already have the pawn on a5 for that. So uh, by playing this a4, a5, not only we are establishing considerable space advantage at the queen side, but we are provoking the opponent to do something at the king side. We are not afraid by a couple of pawns. I mean, if you would have the pawn on h3, you know, I would say nothing of the sort. I would mention the game of Levon Aronian against uh, Vladimir Kromnik, whichever candidates was this, 2015, 16. Somebody knows better than me. Very famous game where Kromnik um, used the fact that Aronian mixed up his opening. He played Italian for the first time, basically, and... Uh, 2018, whatever. Yes, Rook G8 idea. Exactly. 
and Kramnik won a very nice game. And the point was that Aronian had castle short and he had a pawn on h3. Kramnik had not castle short. But look at this, the difference. We didn't have the pawn on h3, we have it on h2. So we gain space and we look for information. I mean, information is how your opponent positions his pawns and pieces. g4, h5, it's information. So let's say your opponent is very reckless, he goes forward. I don't know, try to play a6, b6, maybe knight c3, knight e5. But what exactly is he trying to checkmate you with? Two pawns? What about a king? Uh, g5 is not an unsound plan. I mean, black is hinting at some future idea to start a king's attack. He's hinting at it, but he also needs information. So why do you think he plays g5? This is a provocation. So he is very strong grandmaster. He knows well how to play at the highest level. So he is provoking something. He needs information from white. Of course, g6 was more cautious. All right, so he plays g5. I, I gain space, I play a5. Now I have some information. You see some weaknesses? I do. So knight e2, rook e1. There you go. So I'm about to play knight f1, knight e3, or knight g3 and try to fight for these weaknesses. Thank you for the information. With the pawns on a5 and a6, I think it's fair to assume that black is not castling long because b4, b5 is going to be very quick. The pawn on a6 is a hook that we can potentially exploit. So my opponent play bishop e6 with some ideas like take on c4 somewhere, maybe push d5 or f5. Knight f1, I'm still eyeing for these weaknesses on d5 and f5. This is information. So my opponent wants to play b5, knight g6. I take it and play b4. So the idea is to play knight f4, c4, c5, establish some weaknesses. So this is how the game progressed, knight a4, c4, followed by rook a2, the rook on sec uh, uh, second rank protects the pawn on f2. The bishop on c1 hasn't yet made a move, because we don't know yet where the game is going to take us. And we have established some weaknesses here, knight g3 is guarding the king, g4, h5, h4 is not obviously a checkmate, and ultimately, ultimately I was able to win a very nice game. You know, I'm, I'm trying to remember, did I make a separate YouTube video about this? Because this is a really nice game. I definitely analyzed it on a stream, but I don't remember. I don't remember if I made it a separate video. So again, look at this, how much information we extracted with this early side pawn push. So instead of playing casual rooks, knight c3, rook e1, or rook e1, knight e2, knight f1, knight g3, we played an early a4 and we get information. We are trying to get something out of our opponent. I mean, we try to grab space. And if our opponent plays a5, in some lines it weakens the b5 square, we try to find a way to exploit this. Or in some lines it allows us to get a hook on the pawn on a5. This is really deep. I imagine you're not thinking like this. But most of the chess professionals, they're thinking like this, exactly like this. Would I be afraid of ideas like g5, 97, 96, 94? No. Why should I? It's just one knight, just one pawn. Like, it definitely is an idea somewhere. So if my opponent would be thinking about starting a king's attack, I would be considering answering with a counter strike in the center. Just don't play h3, of course. Don't don't give him target. Don't give him a, a potential hook. Let me show you more. I know you're not used to think about this. This is really advanced, to be honest. I think this is title level. Uh, uh, a title uh, level, yeah. So yet another game of the same system. So in the previous game we had H6G5. This game is on my YouTube channel. So I don't really want to talk about it too much, but we use the same idea. Black wants to play knight a5, what do we do? We play a4. 
secure outpost for the uh, for the bishop and uh if black plays knight a5 here and has some sort of a pawn play it gives us information if i remember correctly i think it was knight a3 c3 b4 we use the pawn on c5 as a target we use the pawn play to generate targets at a queen side if he doesn't uh, do that if he plays king h8 which is one of the core ideas of this um ah i think i oh wait a second this is not yet published <laughs> wait i haven't yet published this video you know i gave it a title hungarian goulash <laughs> because I made a, I, I thought of the title Hungarian Goulash, how to make a Hungarian Goulash out of the Hungarian defense, but it's not yet published because I have something like six videos waiting. Um, I'm waiting for my graphical designer to design thumbnails and uh, she's been missing for several weeks. I finally got the first thumbnail and I instantly published the video and I have something like five videos waiting. And I would like to keep them getting published once a week. So once a week, I would like to publish a video. And yeah, right, this is the Hungarian goulash. I, I, now I remember. So the Hungarian defense and goulash, you already know what it is. So again, the same idea. King h8. Okay, the point why h3 is necessary, I explained the video. So you're going to have to wait for the long version. Knight c3, knight e5 anticipating b4 b5 ideas where the pawn on a4 allows you to do this and essentially yeah here i played a5 a5 looking for targets looking for weaknesses for example one of the lines yeah 95 is not great one of the lines here is that after a6 look at this i get to play b4 again establish um targets at the queen side i'm thinking about rook a3 rook left and if he takes on d5 plays knight b4 he can't retreat to a6 is the pawn on h3 as a hook um but look at this he has cast a short he has cast a short if he would have not cast a short i would not play h3 big important detail now that he has castled i'm ready to play h3 i don't really want to bore you with the theoretical details you're gonna to have to wait for the video but the idea is this h3 is some sort of a waiting move so i need him to play knight g8 so this was the big idea so that i get to play knight c3 and knight e5 on b4 b5 etc and then in some lines black cannot play f4 g5 g4 because i already have the pawn on h3 Okay, let me show you something else. One of my nice games in uh, the French Team Chess Championship 2022, I think. I was playing against Lucas Di, Luca Di Nicolantonio. And my opponent had played the symmetrical Grunfeld and played an early c6. So what's the idea of c6? Black anticipates c4. The point is he wants to take on c4 and make me suffer to win back the spawn. But the point of c6 also has a downside because if you are familiar with the Grunfeld, do you know what is one of the key maneuvers in the Grunfeld? Is there a single Grunfeld player who is watching this? Yes. C5 is a key idea. So there's a good reason why the main move instead of C6 is a short castle. And then after C4, very often black plays C6. It seems the same, but black is thinking, okay, I'm going to be smart. You know, I'm going to change the order of the moves. I'm going to start with C6. 
And now after c4, I'm not going to castle, but I'm going to take on c4 and keep an opportunity to play b5 and castle later. So it's pretty smart, right? You think? But one of the key ideas in all kinds of ground faults is to play c5. And since my opponent is not playing c5, and he has already committed him to c6, we also can be smart. Who says we have to play c4? Um, aren't you playing c5 if only you fianchetto kingside? If you don't fianchetto kingside, what do you mean? Now c5 is pretty common for all kinds of ground files. Uh, it's, it's pretty standard. Yeah, it's pretty standard. I mean, the bishop on g7 needs some... Um, Activity and c5, knight c6, queen b6, or queen f. This is all pretty pretty standard. Very often black even sacrifices this pawn, but c6, it just shows the black is clearly anticipating c4. So, as I was saying, who said we have to play c4? Look for information. There you go. There's your information. We want to grab space. If black plays a5, this is information. Because we might change our mind and play c4 now. And the point is, after d takes knight a3, don't you feel that including a4, a5 favors white? For example, short castle, knight c4, that's a weakness, that's a target. I mean, you, you might argue, of course, yeah, what about the weakness on b4? So we don't really have to do this, but it's definitely an idea. It's information. Now, it definitely favors white. <laughs> but uh, you don't have to rush with this. You could maybe play a different kind of setup. You could play perhaps b3, bishop a3, then c4, and then knight c3, especially considering that black has already played c6, and playing c5 would be a waste of a tempi. So again, I think it's pretty smart. Perhaps, perhaps c5 would be playable, but are you not weakening the b5 square? Yeah, not, not really so obvious. What if, what if I play something like knight c3? C takes, knight e4, maybe you regret in the long run. Because clearly this position with a pawn on a7 and a pawn on a2 favors black. This is okay. But what changes with the pawns on a4 and a5 included? I mean, I have the b5 square. You do not have the b4 square. I hope you understand me correctly. I'm not showing you ways how you immediately demolish your opposition after the first five or seven moves. I'm showing you, for example, with this subtopic, use the side pawn advantage to get information where to position your pieces. That's why people are doing this. So they are taking space and they're getting information because suddenly the game, uh, suddenly you have, yeah, I'm repeating myself, more information. <laughs> so what happened? He played castle, I play a5, space, he played knight a6, clearly waiting for c4 to happen so that he can finally take on c4. Small waiting move c3 and start to be annoying. I want to play queen b3, hit the pawn. How do you defend? I mean, who said I have to play c4? After a couple of moves, Bishop f4, queen c8, treading bishop h3, I decided not to stop it. Queen b3, bishop h3, I just take the pawn on b7, uh, b7 is under attack. So, black's logic is, I'm going to get rid of the bishop to play rook b8 and then play bishop h3. Pretty logic, right? So I play, yeah, so he plays knight h5. He trades the, uh, yeah, first he plays rook b8. And now we start fight for the center, c4. 
which is quite a su surprise for Bly because it seems that we have committed ourselves for c3, c4. And now we play c4 to hit a pawn on d5. Finally, Black carries out the idea of bishop h3. And a couple of months later, Black realizes he's toast. So wait a second, what just happened here? It seems that White wasted the tempo for c3, c4. But a couple of moves later, we get a position where White is clearly the dominating side. We have space advantage to the queen side, a4, a5. And we have the center. Do you understand what just happened here? Probably I would have to go it a bit slower. We play a4 to get information. We get the information. Our opponent is not touching the queen side. We continue grabbing space. We could not have predicted that black is going to play knight a6. He could have played anything else. He could have played bishop 5 He would have. He could have played knight e7. He could have played c5, knight c6. He could have played knight e4. He could have played many moves. We can't predict, but he plays knight a6. He is sort of anticipating c4, d takes on c4, and the knight is exactly where it belongs. Now we play c3 to limit the knight at a6, opening up the queen. Developing the bishop at a4. And now black is so focused on bishop h3 to happen that he tries to make it work. Yes, I also don't like it, but the problem is, how do you deal with this pawn on b7 target? Do you play c5? It seems that white is perfectly ready for this. Maybe even d takes on c5, open up the position. Somehow black is not suited perfectly for this type of play. So he decided to carry out the idea of bishop h3, which I also don't like. He loosened his control of the center. So I'm willing to lose a tempi to fight for the center. And even though black carried out his original idea, he lost the center. Does this make any sense to you? Of course, he could have played something else. He could have played instead of knight a6. He could have played bishop a5. Yes, he could have done this. And after bishop a5, I could choose between c4 and knight e2. How about c4, d takes, and knight e2? There's no more b5. And black already has committed bishop e5. And I could have also chosen between c3, knight e7, and queen b3 to hit the pawn on b7. But you see, with the pawns on a4, a5, this early a4, a5, we are able to pose some questions later and we get a bit more information where black positions his pieces. And that's why in many openings, these early side pawn pushes like a4, a5, h4, h5, like even in the Catalan, h4, h5, it gives unique possibilities because you often get information before you define the placement of your pieces. I am perfectly aware of this is already getting really above your head for many of you. This is really hard. I know. But it's part of the space advantage. You wanted it. <laughs> Um, maybe one more, one more final example, because I'm also getting pretty tired. This was one of my games with black against uh, Ukrainian grandmaster Petro Golubka. Don't be fooled by his rating. He's a strong player. He's just lost a lot of rating points, and uh, here. He had a very original idea. So again, we're thinking about how to continue development. And you're thinking, okay, my knight on e2 is misplaced. And I should be playing knight g3, bishop e2, castle. Or, okay, my bishop is not playing. I should be playing g3, bishop g2. But since the pawn on c4 is under attack, I'm going to play c dx, c dx, g3, bishop g2, etc. I mean... You can do all of those things, but you can also be very creative, like my opponent was.
you don't see recalling this in your games then because you haven't thought about it. This is, uh, like I said, type of level. And this is what uh, pretty much all the grammasters are thinking about. So we started with some basics and then we moved on with really advanced stuff. This is, this is difficult. I agree. This is difficult. And you know, the most difficult part is to understand when you can do this. Is this when you can do this? So, Richie, if you play C Dex, E Dex, and Knight of Four, uh, you hit a pawn on D5, which is really nice. But you should not forget there's different rules at play here. Your king is weak, your king is in the center. So, what do you think a dynamic player is going to do? He's going to play C5. No, no, C5. Your center is not going to hold up. What is your king doing here in the center? Rook e5, knight e5, let's say d-dex on c5, knight e5. <laughs> Chilling, yeah? What about d4? If you play like this to Nimzo in a very creative way, you have to continue in a very creative way. Three guesses what Petro played here with white. Yeah, I guess with the topic, it's already pretty obvious. H4. Now you're looking at this and you're thinking, the guy's crazy. Why? Why is he doing this? Why is he weakening the king? What's the idea? You already know what I'm going to say. He's looking for information. He's looking for break in the center. He's looking for trade. He's looking for, I don't know, f6. This rook can join the game with the third rank as well. The knight on e2 protects the king. h5, h6 can generate targets. This is really deep. So I played very logical counter strike in the center, c5. I mean, why not? I mean, I need to take care of the center. Bishop g5. Now it gets incredibly complex because white has, black has many moves, queen c7, queen b6, f6, bishop e7. Uh, after bishop e7, white could sack the pawn. Is this so obvious? Now this is going to be a mess. So I did play f6, I did. So I did play f6, but it weakens the king. He took it. G takes, I guess, to fight for the center. The king is weak. Rook h3, rook g3 become very interesting ideas. And yeah, there's a lot of very interesting games here. Actually, I think this game is also available on my YouTube channel. I'm starting to think. What was it called? I don't remember. <laughs> so he played bishop d2. Uh, D takes on c4, and here he made a mistake. He played bishop e3, which was pretty weird. Instead, he uh, could have continued with D takes on c5. Knight f4, and the game is incredibly complex. Yeah, so the question is bishop c4, threat, queen h5, long castle, a lot of interesting dynamic ideas. And black is down a pawn. Uh, I'm sorry, black is up a pawn, but suddenly white is incredibly active. And somehow this finishes with a draw. <laughs> there you go. All right, listen. I'm no longer going to torture you. So I would like to summarize. I would like to summarize what we learned today. A couple of key topics. My suggestion is... Take the space advantage whenever you, can, whenever you can. Choose openings which give you space advantage. Don't play openings in general 
where you hand the center for your opponent on the platter. There's a very good reason why nowadays the best players in the world, they're not playing openings which give up the center for nothing. Okay, technically there is the Grunfeld, which I didn't mention, but the Grunfeld, in the Grunfeld, Black gives away the center to Counter-Strike against it immediately. Black is not ignoring the center. And any opening where Black or whichever color you're playing, you're ignoring the center and you allow your opponent to grab it. By definition, you are going for a position where you're worse, where your chances are worse. So in those occasions, you're really relying that your opponent doesn't know what to do with the center. But if he does, well, it's going to be tough. Then again, let's remember why having the space advantage, it's a great catalyst for you to start a potential attack because it's like in football you can control the middle of the field you're closer to the uh, to the goalpost of the opponent and you're not allowing your opponent to be able to start an attack against your king so try to control the middle ground so the more space you can control the better the main rules are pretty obvious about the space advantage if you control space, you try to avoid pieces in general. Why? They can, uh, your opponent's pieces, they don't really have a lot of oxygen, right? They're, they're suffocating. They don't have a lot of space to move. And the same applies for your opponent. If you're suffering or you are the opponent and you are playing and you're suffering, you don't have any space, what do you do? You want to trade. Why? So that you don't have to share this very tiny room with other 10 people <laughs> like this basement example i mentioned to you and finally this very difficult part the side pawn pushes in many openings this is really advanced i know this so if you want to re-watch this on youtube you can even skip this part but at least i hope you it's going to open a bit your mind so that for example you're looking at some of the games of the highest level players like magnus carlsen like fabi karana or firuja or gukesh or whatever all of them, they're using this. All of them. Yeah, so I'm just telling you from the Grandmaster's, grandmaster's perspective, uh, the understanding of the space advantage has evolved immensely. And that's why many openings, they're getting revisited for these early side pawn pushes, getting information early so that you know where to position your pieces. But of course, you would have to be a great improviser to understand how to react to uh, every single... Um, scenario in the best way otherwise it makes no sense <laughs> i mean you can use those side pump pushes but if you're not a great improviser you don't know how to react properly then it makes no sense to do this at all just play normal chess